Look at this room. There isn't a place other than maybe the haram or maybe some jami'ah, some place of learning that you could have a collection of Muslims this diverse. Right? Maybe Meshul and Nebuwe, but somewhere very... There is no other country that you could just walk into the halls of a university and see a Muslim community this diverse. This many hues, this many stories, this many languages, and we have to ask ourselves, what is the purpose of all of this? What are we supposed to be doing? What are we supposed to represent? When I think about, I thought somebody else was going to give me another bottle of water for the scratchiness of my voice. I already have one. When I think about what our community could achieve, I think we are a community that can represent the fulfillment of some of the best promises made by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, made by the Quran, and made by the Deen of Islam. And what I want to spend the majority of the time that has been allotted to me doing is talking about some of those promises. And then engaging you in a conversation. Because I realize many times the scholars, the teachers, the presenters, they come to the front of the room and it's almost like the light dims on us and we have our own little soliloquy. No, I want to talk with you because everything I'm offering is just an extension of what I can see. You might see something different. The first thing in terms of what we have to offer, we should be giving da'wah. We should be... وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا إِلَّا مِمَّنْ دَعَا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Who is better in speech than one who calls to Allah and says, I am from among the Muslims. I have you know something. If you're talking about, and I realize there can be some argument about this. I mean, if you want to argue with me, you can. I mean, you'd be wrong, but you can. That's up to you. When you talk about the legitimacy of Muslims living in a majority non-Muslim land where they will inevitably be impacted in their ability to practice Islam with integrity, there are serious legal opinions that state our being here is not legitimate. I hate, to, I hate to burst your bubble. There are serious fiqhi opinions that say for Muslims to reside in a non-Muslim country in which they are disempowered, right? meaning someone else's norms culturally, religiously can be forced on them. Their deen is jeopardized, compromised, by way of them being a disempowered minority, they should leave that situation. They should make hijrah. Unless their purpose there is one of da'wah. They are there to be a kind of embassy. They are, they are there to be ambassadors to the way of the Prophet ﷺ. And this does not mean that I think our community should be standing on street corners, proselytizing, giving out pamphlets, and just being obnoxious to people. You see those videos on YouTube with those fiery young men arguing with everybody who walks by. I don't think there's any utility in that. But we should not be reticent. We should not be shy about the fact that we're proud to be Muslim. You know, I was with my family. Every Eid, we take a family vacation. And... <clears throat> I don't know what my wife was watching on the internet, but she got into this thing, man, where she wants to go to all of the national parks in America. I'm like, you wanna, you wanna go hiking? Why don't we just go to a city and take the kids to a theme park? But no, she wants to hike. So last year we went to Utah, you know, arches, 
Bryce, Can Bryce Canyon, Zion National Park. And we were doing one of these cruises, we're cruising down the Colorado River. And the tour guide just probably, this is just something she does normally. She said, so where do we got people coming in from and why are you here? And so when she kind of like came to me, I said, Chicago, and what brings you? I said, family vacation. My son, Najashi, he looked at me and said, family vacation, E-trip, E-trip. She said, E-trip, e e we're Muslim. <laughs> at the end of Ramadan, we have an E-trip. And I saw her searching for, well, well, congratulations. <laughs> and what I saw in that was something really transformative. My son wasn't trying to be pushy. He wasn't trying to be obnoxious. He has a natural pride in his religion. And it is not something that he would conceal. So when he heard me say, uh, family vacation, dad, what are you talking about? E-trip. There's no family. I said, son, it's kind of the same thing. No, it's not the same thing, Dad. He, tripped. he was six, right? When I say da'wah, I'm talking about something that is coming from us toward the people we encounter as naturally as that came from my son, right? Not something we're rehearsing, not something that sounds, you know, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, rehearsed and, 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 no, just something natural, man. I'm proud to be Muslim, right? And sharing that with people and inviting them to it. I know some people are reluctant to say, but if we've learned anything from the LGBT community, it's that a willingness to sacrifice for what you believe in will lead to people respecting you. If you are willing to put it on the line, if you are willing to proclaim boldly and forwardly, this is who I am, and I cannot be alienated. You know, one of the things about following the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that one of the names, and this is one of my favorite names given to the Prophet والسلام, is Al Insan al Kamil, the complete human being. And this does not simply mean that he is complete in his virtue, this means that his experience is completely human. And if you are someone who aims to reflect some of that Muhammadan character, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then there is no person that you should feel you can't talk to, you can't relate to, you can't, right? No, no. Search, seek, right? So we have to be, I think we have to be a community of da'wah. I myself have gone through different iterations in terms of da'wah. You know, when I first became Muslim, man, I was fiery. I mean, I would walk around downtown Chicago in my jubba, looking for someone to debate, <laughs> armed with books of Ahmed Didat, Dr. Zakir Naik, Hafizullah, looking for someone who wants to debate with me, right? Pestering people. I mean, I remember it got so crazy. If the pizza man came to my house, <laughs> I would take the pizza and say, now, you know, there's more to life than just cheese and pepperoni. <laughs> He looked, now nah, you gonna give me a tip or not? Yeah, I'm gonna give you a tip. My first tip is <laughs> don't wear suede shoes in the rain. Second tip, I advise you to learn about Allah and His Messenger. Third tip, I hope you find this generous because we are Muslim. And I've had 25 minute conversations with people from doing that. And then after a while, I started to feel more shy, more reluctant. And then I found that I really didn't want to talk to my neighbors. I really didn't want to talk to people I encountered about Islam. I think we have to get back 
to a place of being very comfortable with who we are. And to know that we're inviting people to najah. We're inviting them to salvation. We're not, you know, subhanAllah. In order for you to convey, they say, فَاقِدُ الشَّيْءِ لَا يُعْتِي The person that is not in possession of something can't give it. So if you are carrying your religious commitment like it's a burden, this is just a burden, right? This is just something I have to do. You carry it like a yoke around your neck that you're just dragging. Who in the world would be attracted to that? Why would anybody see you and think, man, look at how depressed he looks. Look at how overwhelmed and overburdened she looks. That's what I want to be. Right? There's a verse in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the believers say, and Allah, don't make us a fitna lilladina kafiru. Don't make us a fitna for the people who disbelieve. Baydawi interprets this verse, don't make us losers so that people who disbelieve see us and think, I would never want to be with those people. Right? We should be committed to presenting Islam and representing Islam in ways that are intentionally beautiful and attractive. That's the first thing. The second promise that I think we can deliver on. Man, my time is going fast away, man. Right? The second promise is something that I'm reminded of by... This bottle of Kirkland water, no, by Sheikh Sha'arawi. You know, I worked as a translator on the tafsir of Muhammad Mutawalli al Sha'arawi, the great Egyptian. Not, not a classical scholar, actually a contemporary scholar, but he had an amazing uh, understanding of the Quran. And one thing that I encountered in his tafsir that I think about with relation to our community all the time is that he said, are we, are we good? Sorry. Man, you can't creep up on me like that, man. You almost, you almost caught one, man. <laughs> he said, our problem is that people like Abu Jahl, people like Utba, people like Shaiba, People like Abu Lahab, they understand more deeply the implications of La ilaha illallah than we do. You must understand, they knew the character of the Prophet wasallam. They knew that he was not a liar. They knew that he was not possessed. They knew that he was not crazy. Their unwillingness to accept Islam was only based on the fact that it was going to interrupt the status quo. It was going to interrupt their unchallenged monopoly politically, economically. And this is what they did not want. He said, we say la ilaha illallah and we don't understand that it also has those social implications. We think we can keep doing whatever it is we've been doing and just say, and just say la ilaha illallah as a theological credo. There is nothing worthy of worship except God. He said, no. In fact, the true da'i, the true caller to God, is only making an effective prophetic call to God when people understand that their call is interrupting any of the oppression and wrongdoing that has become systemic in that society. That's when you know People understand what you mean when you say la ilaha illallah. In the context of the United States of America, our la ilaha illallah must include a real critique, intervention, interruption of racism. That must be entailed in our la ilaha illallah. That's entailed in our la ilaha illallah. And we should be not entering the debates between the conservative and the woke. I don't think there's any utility in that. 
our community should serve as an example of what it means for people from different backgrounds to live together and respect each other. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal nas, inna khalaqnaakum min dhakirin wa untha wa ja'alnaakum shu'uba wa kaba'ila li ta'arufu inna akramakum inda Allahi atqaakum inna Allah alimul khabir. O humanity, we created you from one male and one female and then we spread you into nations and tribes. Li ta'arufu inna akramakum inda Allahi atqaakum Truly the most ennobled of you. Or rather, one male and one female to, to know one another. Lita Alfa. The most ennobled of you in God's sight are those in possession of the greatest taqwa. You know, sometimes I joke to myself that subhanAllah, before I accepted Islam, all of you, most of you, I would have just considered you Puerto Rican. <laughs> I'm from Chicago, and there were three kinds of people in the world. You had black people? That I understand. That I understand. You had white people? That I understand. And then everybody else is Puerto Rican. Look, <laughs> like Puerto Rican. Just, that was, Puerto Rican was like a catch all. Racially ambiguous category. She must have been Puerto Rican. I don't know, something, something like that. And now I find myself enjoying meaningful relationships of brotherhood and sisterhood with people from all over the world. People I never thought I would have been able to relate to as brothers and sisters. And there's great love, there's great affection, there's great connection between us. If we could just sell that to our neighbors, that Islam does this. But first, we know we have to get our house in order. That Islam does this. If we could just say, you know, you know this, is what is, this is the way that Islam unites people. Not in a way that is fictitious and let's pretend like we're all the same. No, we should be distinct, but we all respect each other. We're all connected through our love for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And even in that, our relationships are not without their difficulties. We still, whenever, you know, diversity, a good friend of ours, a family friend, she said, Diversity is just a euphemism for conflict. Whenever people are different, there's going to be some conflict. What Dean gives us is a means of resolving that conflict. It's going to be some conflict. Right? Sometimes I think your food is just too spicy. Too spicy. Sometimes you don't like the fact that, you know, I remember a brother told me, he said, you know, I, I wanted to pray at a masjid in the community where the congregants are predominantly African American. I said, well, why didn't you? He said, because they kept talking during the khutbah. I said, they, they were talking during the khutbah? He said, yeah, man, the imam would say something and somebody would say, that's right, brother. <laughs> no, it's, it's, that's right, teach. Talk about it. That's us, tell the truth, tell the truth. And he was like, Al Kalam fi ithna al khutbah haram. Talking during the khutbah is impermissible. And I said, Akhi, I give khutbah at masajid all over the country. And every time I say, Inna Allah wa malaikatuhu yusalluna ala nabi, ya yuhaladina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Everybody in the congregation says, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Everybody says that. I said, is that speech during the khutbah? He said, no, because they're not talking to anyone. It's just a dua for the Prophet ﷺ. I said, when they do that during Juma, it is not my preference. It's something that I really would prefer they didn't do. But it's not speech that has a mukhatab. They're not talking to anybody. It's just shatahat, something that just comes out. And you're going to let this kind of furu'i, secondary issue, 
keep you from the primary goal of Muslim unity, of ittihad al-Muslimin, something like that? This is what's separating us? I said, Akhi, imagine when he goes to your masjid and nobody's talking during the khutbah. He's probably thinking, man, is this Juma or Janazah, man? What is this? What's, what's, what's going on here, man? But that's something that we would say, what? Get over that, people. We have our differences. We have our differences culturally. We have our differences in terms of the Islam that we practice. All of this will make us stronger if we embrace them. Of course, within limits. I'm not saying that somebody can do something outside the boundaries of the shara and then say, it's a black thing, man. You wouldn't understand. No, no, it's a haram thing. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But let's not allow these superficialities to divide us. I think if we do that, this can be a mission of our community. See, I'm trying to give you missions. That's what we need. A people perish in the absence of a mission. You talk about Islam in America, this is a mission. Da'wah, that's a mission. Repudiating racism, that's a mission. The last thing that I'll say is having a community in which we esteem and celebrate the educational and professional achievements of our sisters, man. It really disheartened me when I heard the news coming out of Afghanistan about women in primary and higher ed. And I just thought to myself, subhanAllah, I don't want to pass judgment because I'm not there. I don't know the walk yet. I, I'm not on the ground. And anybody that has a background in fiqh knows it is unwise to look at a decision and then comment upon that decision without knowing what's animating it. It might be a concern about safety. It might be, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not there. But I do think the fact that this is an educational program and the auditorium is equally divided between brothers and, well, I should have did brothers. <laughs> brothers and sisters. And the fact that I know that Miftah as an institute makes you know, a keen point to include our sisters in its programming, recognizing that our community will never reach its potential if we don't empower our sisters through education and also through authority as chaplains, as religious directors, as, you know, mashallah, I, mean, I, have, I, have, I have two daughters. And the most involved task of my parenting is trying to show all of my children that there is nothing better than Islam. In the deen, in the Allah, in Islam. The deen with Allah is Islam. And I'm, I'm, I'm every day, whenever I can, attempt to make a compelling case that, man, there's nothing better than Islam, I do. In any way that I can. So the fact that we have programs, we invite our sisters to the member to address audiences. We embrace female scholarship. This is something that has made my job a lot easier, man. And I think this needs to continue being an element of focus for our community.